Australia, we need to talk about revenue. Future challenges like tackling climate change, fixing aged care and making childcare affordable and accessible will all require more government spending. On October the 6th, the Australia Institute's Revenue Summit 2022 will bring together economists, academics, policy and taxation experts at Australian Parliament House in Canberra to discuss revenue raising options to meet Australia's growing public spending needs. Keynote speakers include Rod Sims, former chair of the ACCC, Dr Richard Dennis and Sally McManus, secretary of the ACTU. Tickets are strictly limited, so head on over to australiainstitute.org au to book your early bird ticket today and save fifty dollars what had happened even before the pandemic was real wages were not growing very fast at all and so when you have a bit of a decline what often happens is a bit like as we were talking about with education the the collapse can come very quickly and is very damaging and it takes a long time to recover. So we had sort of about eight years of slow increasing of, of real wages and, and it was wiped away in less than two years. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long, does it? One for mum, one for dad, one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be in Australia. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Treasurer. Don't the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in you know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day. And welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today we're going to tell you everything you need to know about the Jobs and Skills Summit. The second day of the summit really off to a positive start. Well, the Jobs Summit has wrapped up in our nation's capital today with the Prime Minister declaring the two-day event an extraordinary success. It was a resounding success that changed the whole mood of politics and the way that it's conducted. Brought uh, big and small businesses, unions and others together. It was the summit of smile. Two days of talks, 36 outcomes and one of the biggest winners are seen. Migrant numbers, 35,000 more. Multi-employer bargaining. This makes sense because only one in seven workers at the moment are covered by an enterprise agreement. Uh, that would be a significant step backwards. We should make it accessible to all. I've heard the word disability theme three times today. That didn't happen in the past. It's about seeking more and better agreements and not more conflict. Acknowledgement that small businesses play a really important role in the economy. There was a job summit, apparently. Uh, Did they get any jobs? As the government describes it, the Jobs and Skills Summit brought together Australians to work constructively on the challenges and opportunities facing the Australian labour market and economy. And let's face it, things in the Australian labour market are not great. Real wages are declining, casual work has been on the rise, and there's many other issues for us to get stuck into. So to give us the lowdown, today I'm joined by Greg Jericho, Labour Market and Fiscal Policy Director at the Australia Institute's Centre for Future Work. G'day, Greg. Hi, Ebony. To kick us off, uh, I know why the government uh, said it wanted the job summit, but why was one needed? Why was the government so keen to do it? What was it trying to achieve? Well, as as you point out, the issues with industrial relations and the mm, labour market yep, are pretty doesn't take long, dire does it? At, at present. Do you um, just want to paint us a picture? Of- <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, there's there's a number of things wrong, all of which lead to a bit of an outcome of real wages falling drastically, which in real wages basically means that inflation and prices are rising faster than wages. And that's come about uh, not only because we've had this recent spike in inflation, but because over the past decade, you could say a decade, um, we've really had this situation where bargaining within four wages has really sort of... Uh, I guess, gone to hell, (laughs) to put it in a nice technical point of view, where we've seen a real increase in, I think, mistrust between employers and employees, um, where we've seen the enterprise bargaining system pretty much break down and 
just in general a real sort of um, strangulation, I think, of of industrial relations in Australia and, and, a, and a real rise in the temperature as well. We saw this very much under the last government, a real sort of us versus them operation occurring. And so the government, aside from all the political optics of it all, really, if they wanted to fix it, kind of needed to get everybody in the room because if you were just going to, as a Labor Party might be presumed to do, of just talk to unions, that wasn't going to fix that us versus them narrative. And the job summit really was trying to overcome that as much as anything. Part of the reason, well, the main reason why wages have collapsed is because collective bargaining's collapsed. It now only covers one in seven workers. That's about 14% of the workforce. And the people that are missing out are feminised industries, so aged care, child care, but also people in small workplaces as well. The changes that we are working through in consultation with employers and with unions and with the broader Australian community is about seeking more and better agreements and not more conflict. And so tell us about who was at the job summit. Could anyone rock up? Who was there? Well, we weren't there, Ev. I'm I'm (laughs) not sure I wasn't there. But um, there were around, I think, did they end up being about 140 people? I think it was. They tried to limit it to 100, but like a wedding, uh, that number just kept uh, (laughs) rising. It really was a mixture of union representatives. Uh, They made up about 30%. Um, employer groups and and actual employer CEOs like uh, Alan Joyce, head of Qantas. Uh, there were heads of Woolworths and Coles and various other major organisations, and and a mixture of uh, community groups um, like ACOS and also um, state government representatives as well. So um, the idea was really not to have people on opposite sides of the fence, but all in a room together, what do we agree on type yeah, of Yeah, and, and even the way it was set up, everyone, it was all sort of in a, a semicircle, um, not this real sense of putting people on one side or the other. There was a real mixture of... Uh, not the way we set up groups. parliament, no. for example. <laughs> And um, and certainly in the way even it was organised, and, and it certainly was organised to within an inch of its life, um, hmm. but it was done in a way in which uh, the panels would have people from various different groups. So it wouldn't just be a union group and then an employer group. They were all on the sort of the, the table together and, and included as well, importantly, I think, were academics um, who were able to provide a bit of a a counter to perhaps some of the um, talking points that were getting pushed by either side. Mm. So tell us, what were some of the key outcomes of the summit? Well, I think actually even before we get to the summit, I think we'd even seen already um, a number of key outcomes. And this was because I think that that overriding sort of a sense of, okay, let's get everyone in the room and let's all start talking was really taken up um, especially by the ACTU and also by some key business groups, the BCA and um, the Small Business Organisation of Australia. And that already started sort of setting out some frameworks on things that they'd agreed to, um, which then when they got to the actual um, job summit, there was almost this platform on which um, they could actually achieve some outcomes. So some of the big ones, um, and and again, it wasn't all you know, the union's wish list or employer's wish list, there there was a bit of give and take. And, and one of the, the big sort of ticket items at the start was uh, an increase in the um, permanent migration numbers from 160,000 to 195,000. Now, businesses have very much been after an increase in migration because there has been a I guess, a, a huge demand for, for workers. Job vacancy numbers are certainly at record levels. Um, But what we saw was not perhaps what businesses and what we have seen over the past sort of five to ten years of an increase in temporary migration levels, but an increase in permanent migration levels, which is something that uh, I guess in some ways unions can live with and unions want because permanent migrants are more likely to, one, be members of a union. They're less likely to be in situations where they're going to get exploited. Mm -hmm. Uh, because temporary, you know, you think about it, if you're on a temporary work visa, in a sense, your employer holds that work visa over you. And if you're no longer working, you no longer have the, the rights the to, to stay here. Yeah. And so that has led to some 
just truly horrific exploitation over the past decade. So in a sense, this is um, covering off that aspect, but also meeting that the needs for actual um, workers, especially in hospitality and agricultural industries where yeah. there really is a, a bit of a shortage. And I noticed the Prime Minister kind of described that in a way as permanent migration. You know, they'll have a stake in Australia's future as well. I thought that was... Yeah, I mean, I I think, you know, where you, there's often been a lot of sort of uh, contention and controversy with migrants uh, and certainly migrant workers has been that sense of the businesses are just bringing them in to to sort of deflate wages and uh, kind of taking jobs away from us, which which is not a a thing that actually happens in economics. It's a terrible way of thinking about it. But this sense that, oh, they're coming doing the job and then leaving and in a sense Australia is not much better off but with permanent migrant I mean Australia is based on on migration um you know we're all migrants apart from First Nations people and truly not with permanent migration you're not just bringing your labor but you're bringing your community you're bringing your culture and it just adds to Australia I think as Mm. a whole and so but also with that um, permanent migration also brings with it a need for governments to not just think, oh, well, this is just a stopgap measure. We actually need to do some planning about the fact that they're here permanently. <laughs> so we need to start thinking about housing and infrastructure and various other things. They and so, along I, with it. yeah, and that was something that certainly did uh, happen as well with in, at the Jobs Summit. Uh, I think it was $575 million has been allocated towards sort of infrastructure and social housing, which is something that you almost need to ensure that you do cover off when you are talking about increased migration because, of course, house prices are just absurd. Rent prices are, are really biting, um, especially as interest rates keep rising up, as I've just risen Done. up just now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if you're, in a sense, just looking at increasing the number of people to to cover sort of any notional work shortages and you're not bothering about the other side, you are going to get resistance in the community to migration because people think, oh, you know, this is just adding to house prices, yeah. whereas it does seem like they're so at they, least mindful of that. Yeah, they took a, a more holistic approach. The federal government has just announced that it will be lifting the permanent migration cap from 160,000 to 195,000 over this year. What it means is thousands more workers, thousands more nurses coming into the country. I think it's just common sense. You know, we actually need more skilled labour here. But... Small businesses, farming businesses, uh, getting skills from both on-the-job training and from increased migration. Uh, migration is welcome, but probably not enough. Quickest short-term fix is by lifting skilled migration. In industries like care and hospitality and hort, we should not be relying on a revolving door of temporary migrants because locals don't want to work there. Because the fundamental problem for the revolving door is low wages, low conditions and poor job quality. One of the other things that the Prime Minister and I think the Treasurer kind of said in the lead up to it was obviously this idea that, you know, we want to make some headway, but we're not going to solve the skills crisis overnight after it's been building for (laughs) a decade. What about skills specifically? We've talked a little bit uh, on the podcast about, you know, vocational education and the destruction of TAFE through privatisation and and other things. How big of a problem is that and what did the summit come up with? Well, as you say, it's a massive problem, one that's been ongoing. um, And it's always the problem with skill shortages and and just even general education uh, issues is that they are really hard to fix quickly because, you know, even if you think about... um, you know, as as the government or as has been announced through the job summit, that there's been a, a big increase in the the number of free TAFE uh, places. I think it's about that. They're aiming for four hundred and sixty five thousand fee free TAFE places. Um, from memory, it's about one hundred and eighty thousand in the first year. You know, that's looking at about a, an extra one billion dollars in funding. Now, that will certainly initially provide a boost, but what we see with with uh, problems with skill shortages is these things, they take a long time to actually work through. Yes, there will be um, an extra few, an extra uh, hundred eighty thousand places in the first year, but we still need those people to develop those skills, and then they can 
address the school shortages. So <laughs> yeah. everything in education, yeah, the pipeline. everything in education is always a lag, and <clears throat> and it, the the I guess the um, deeper the problem, the longer the lag. Especially if you start looking at um, you know higher education and even secondary education, where you know you might do you know you think about things uh, even if it's just outside of sort of technical aspects if you're thinking things like languages or something you think okay we've got to increase you know australians uh, ability to speak say indonesian or languages of of asian nations and it's like okay we'll bring in something but it's not like somebody year 11 is going to just take <laughs> it up in year 12 for, for yeah. money. it's something that takes years to work through the system it's the same with with tafe problems where as you're right, there's been this massive privatisation that has just seen what was a very good system pretty much uh, not destroyed but certainly gutted. damaged and <laughs> gutted and that's going to take a long time to, to recover because it's not just, okay, we need, we've got these places now for people to take them. One, we have to make sure that there is a demand for those places, that people have got the, the skills in a sense that they've got from from high school to be able to take up those skills. And also we need to think about who's going to train all these Teach people. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you can't just say, oh, there's 180,000 extra places and, oh, by the way, you've just got to double the number of people you're teaching. You need to think about the number of, of teachers and trainers and also you need to think about their wages as well. It needs to be an attractive proposition to do you know yeah a lot of apprentices apparently don't finish because yeah. apprentice wages are oh. so low they can't afford to basically yeah absolutely horrific there'll be a good uptake and they'll last a year and you know they need to to rent just like everybody else yeah and it's not enough to think oh well if i one day become a plumber i'm going to be doing rather nicely <laughs> I'll be doing all right. it's it's a case you've got to survive to get there and it's, it's it doesn't pay for two minute yeah, noodles it, this it's week it's very tough and so these type of issues it, it just highlights just how tough solving a skills crisis is mm. is that it's, it's not just a case of oh let's just get more numbers it's okay we got more numbers that's great in tape but you know what about how how are people going to survive while they're doing TAFE? Um, you know, once they do an apprenticeship, what's the issue there? Have we got people to do the teaching and and all? It it really yeah. is a a vast problem, and it's why it's it takes such a long time to fix because it's kind of easy to ruin, mm. and as we've seen, um, because you just have to kind of ignore it or purposefully leave it to privatization and the free market and and it doesn't uh work at all but it just um repairing that takes a lot longer than it does to destroy it mm. so no one was expecting it was going to get solved but we do at least seem to have got at least the conversation started and some some programs in place that are at least getting it uh getting it fixed yeah the true measure of these days will be if we can look back and say that as a result of what we have agreed here, more young Australians found apprenticeships or enrolled in TAFE, more small businesses could find and keep the staff that they need to grow. The next more thing I want to ask about and was really, I think, one of the, the key things that was discussed um, both before and at the summit was industrial relations reform. So unions were pushing very hard for um, multi-sector bargaining to be back on the table. And instead of just having an enterprise-based system, let's add to that multi-employer or sector-based bargaining. This makes sense because only one in seven workers at the moment are covered by an enterprise agreement. Uh, business groups were kind of pushing back against that. We do see this uh, as a backdoor means uh, to open up uh, sector-wide industry uh, bargaining again, uh, that would be a significant step backwards. What is the problem there and what did the summit come up with? Well, the problem depends a little bit on your point of view, I guess. The, <laughs> the, the problem is, is very much a political one in that multi-employer bargaining quickly can get um, treated in, a, in any scare campaign as industry-wide bargaining and people suggesting that we're going to go back to the way it was, I guess, prior to sort of the Hawke government in the 1970s, where you had situations where in, an entire industry could essentially go on strike and bargain for a wage, regardless of 
what type of enterprise you work for or where you were. And so you were seeing the wages for people in very strong areas, for example, of construction, getting the same rate as people in areas of the country that weren't actually doing that well. And and this brought with it this great fear that, oh, we're going to see this... Um, an outbreak of strikes and 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 you know non competitive uh, wage rises and so forth. Business leaders concern changes to industrial relations laws allowing multi employer bargaining will encourage widespread industrial action. Uh, we'll see uh, a lot more strike action. Of a move back to the 70s and the 80s, the dark old ages of industry wide bargaining. That's not what is on the table. It's, there has been no suggestion either by the ACTU or by the government that they want to return to the 1970s, which, again, even it's not even realistic because it was a completely different sort of IR system, very centralised. The government had a real role in setting wages and, and everything. What they're talking about here is an issue which quite sort of um, ironically is actually already in the Fair Work Act where... Currently in the Fair Work Act, for low-paid uh, occupations, there is an ability to have multi-employer bargaining. The problem is it, it very rarely occurs and the sort of the, the test to be able to occur just are rarely met. What we're talking about here are industries, especially where you've got a lot of small businesses, where you're likely to maybe only have two or three, maybe four employees where you're not going to see, you know, unionism at any high level and you're not going to see, you know, you, know, you don't really have union meetings where there's only three of you. And, in <laughs> you know, we're not talking like Coles or Woolworths or BHP or even any of the major banks or, or for example, um, uh, the public service and, and education where you have high levels of unionism because, you know, teachers, for example, they... They have one employer, it is the, the state government or the Catholic system or or the independent schools, and there is an ability to have a high level of, of equal bargaining between the two groups. But if you're in, uh, let's say you work in, in a cafe or a restaurant or, for example, a childcare centre where there's not many employed, the actual bargaining is quite unequal. You've you've really got very little choice. You're almost taking what the the employer gives you, or you're kind of threatened with, oh, well, you could go on the award rate, essentially on minimum wage. And what what is being proposed is a system that would enable, if both sides agree to it, um, as well, where an employer and and employees could engage in multi-enterprise bargaining such that, for example, childcare centre workers are paid at the same rate rather than them having to negotiate with each employer. And so it allows workers to have a bit more actual bargaining power um, to actually get some better outcomes because what we've seen over the past decade is this lack of bargaining power, meaning that wages, especially in um, low-paid occupations, which are generally characterised by small businesses or we have um, low-skilled um, workers. Or the feminised industries. And very much, them. as I say, and very much the feminised industries, the care sector, where they really don't have much power, they're getting very poor wage outcomes. And this is in a sense, a way to address that. But it also, it's, it's, a, it's a situation where there are actual benefits for employers as well. If you're a cafe owner or a restaurant, you've got a restaurant right next door to you, it's, it's actually kind of good for you to know that the person next to you is paying the waiters and the, you know, the um, kitchen hand the same rate and not feeling like, oh, I, you know, maybe takes away a little bit of that uh, temptation that certainly is in the hospitality in, at the moment for wage theft in mm. the sense that, oh, I'll, I, I need to to undercut my workers just to stay ahead. Well, if you know that, you know, the people on the same street are getting paid the same amount, that kind of gives you a bit of um, ability to go, right, well, I, I know I can compete 
just on the quality of my product rather than feeling like I need to undercut workers just to kind of mm. stay ahead. So so it's I don't think it is a return to this pattern bargaining or industry-wide bargaining, but it's more about addressing the power imbalance that currently exists. Yeah, and we certainly know that raw wages are declining and things have just not been working to the Mm. point where even the RBA governor was like, I'm not going to increase interest (laughs) rates until wages go up, but we didn't Uh, see that happen either. Yeah, so good for that. (laughs) The board will not increase the cash rate until inflation is sustainably in the target range. We are prepared to look through spikes in the inflation rate as we have done with headline CPI inflation this year. For inflation to be sustainably in the target range, wages growth will have to be materially higher than it is now. This is likely to take time and the board is prepared to be patient. Good afternoon. The cost of living has taken another hit with the Reserve Bank increasing interest rates for the fifth month in a row. The official rate is going up half a percent to two point... Yeah, I mean, when you've got real wages now back essentially where they were a decade ago. I mean, something's wrong. Yeah. And, and yes, there's been a big, big jump in, in inflation that has an impact, but what had happened even before the pandemic was real wages were not growing very fast at all. And so when you have a bit of a decline, what often happens is, a bit like as we were talking about with education, the, the collapse can come very quickly and is very damaging and it takes a long time to recover. So we had sort of about eight years of slow increasing of, of real wages and, and it was wiped away in less than two years. Mm, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long, does it? And we've seen actually the middle class shrink under this previous government and that that's happened because there's an institutional problems with how wages rise in this economy and in this country and those have to be rectified and have to actually be rectified through this job's uh, summit and uh, so Greg is there anything else people should know before we kind of wrap up uh, yeah one, another big thing that was is sort of a bit more technical but again it was something that was there was a bit of agreement on it prior to the job summit and certainly um, had momentum throughout it was the changes to a thing known as the better off overall test or the commonly boot the, test. Boot, <laughs> the boot the um, boot which was introduced during the Rudd government years by um, Julie Gillard with the Fair Work Act and it kind of it re- well it was brought in because uh, under work choices uh, John Howard had gotten rid of a thing called a no disadvantage test and perhaps a little bit in response to just the horror show that was work choices the better off overall test was fairly technical quite complex perhaps just to ensure that it wouldn't be abused in the way that occurred under under work choices. And perhaps, uh, as sometimes happens, the, the cure perhaps went a little bit too far and, and created sort of unforeseen problems. And, and everyone's kind of of the, of the agreement that it's just too complex, that yep. you can come up with hypothetical cases that aren't actually even in the agreements that mean that it's you're not better off overall and everyone's kind of say how about we try and make this this a little bit uh more simple and also bring back the sense that well if unions and and employers come to an agreement then kind of they've come to an agreement and (laughs) and maybe actually just say yeah they've that if especially if the workers have have voted for that agreement um then maybe we just take that as given that people were smart enough to know when they're better off or not and so that is something that uh, both sides have certainly wanted and it's all of these things are things that I think that were much better sorted after an election than before and it's not a case of the government not breaking breaking promises or doing things that it, it said it wouldn't do but it's just a case these are arguments that are very subject to kind of absurd fear campaigns. And really, once you got all the grown-ups in the room, um, as certainly happened in this this case, that heat of an election campaign and the fear campaign really wasn't there. And people were actually, it was more about, okay, what do we agree on? And yes, there are still things we disagree on. Certainly, multi-employer bargaining is not you know something that all employer groups love. But it was a case of, we know things are wrong. 
let's worry more about fixing them than pointing out things that we disagree on. And I think that was really the major achievement of the Job Summit. So Peter Dutton, the opposition leader, refused to go, describing it as nothing more than a talk fest. Uh, To come to the politics of it (laughs) uh, rather than the actual outcomes, I mean, that's a bit of an exercise from Peter Dutton in lowering people's expectations did uh, did the government succeed in exceeding th- those expectations? I think they did because they actually did come out with some some actual results that they were going to do straight away, such as the the change to the migration, multi employer bargaining, the the skills package, and so forth. And because David Littleproud actually went, the <laughs> the leader of the National Parties w- was in the room, so it was a bit tough for. Um, Peter Dutton to be saying it's a talk fest when his main partner in the coalition was in the room talking. Yeah. We believe as a party that represents solely regional rural Australia, we very rarely get our voice heard. We're the forgotten Australians and it was important that no matter how hollow this may be, that we turned up and we prosecuted a case for regional rural Australia. I take my job very seriously in representing regional rural Australia. Um, and so were employer groups who notionally are the, the key constituent of, of the Liberal Party. Um, it was... Look, I, if I'm being generous, I can understand Peter Dutton not wanting to go, um, but I think his criticisms have kind of fallen a, a little bit flat. And and actually, the the danger is it sets him up as a bit of already as a bit of yesterday's man who's still doing that us versus them kind of model where everyone is kind of at the sense of can we please just agree on something for once <laughs> and and we'll get surely we will disagree later in and you know whenever there is any bargaining in industrialization industrial relations um it always comes to us versus them because there's an employer and there's employees but this was more about okay let's let's at least change some of the framework that we're going to be bargaining within and if you're not in the room you're not part of the decision-making process. And, and it really, I don't think it, it benefited him. The the coverage, and, and a lot of this is off about optics, certainly the coverage in the media, and that's across the board from Guardian to the Fin Review and everywhere in between if they are the two polar opposites, <laughs> um, which I'm not quite sure. But um, certainly the, the coverage was very positive. You know, there was no, even the the... The vision that you saw was very much of, of, you know, really good discussion of everyone being there and, you know, there was no shouting or things like that going on. Mm. And so I I really did look like, oh, this is actually how government should operate. This is how (laughs) public policy... Why have we been doing it the other way for so long? (laughs) What's been going on since 2013? Did something happen uh, back then that that changed all of this? And I think it, it really... It's something that uh, certainly was purposefully done by um, the government. This that was what they wanted to convey, but it, it's there's a difference between wanting to convey that and actually pulling it off. And mm. I think they they did pull it off. And given the complexity of people who were in the room, the voices, the different issues that were discussed, you know, and and it wasn't all success. There wasn't much done on gender pay gap and things like that. And certainly no big announcements on childcare or parental paid leave. Mm. Um, You know, there were all these moving parts, all these different voices. And the fact that you didn't, for example, have the BCA or Aki coming out afterwards and saying, well, that was just a complete waste of our time. Yeah. That demonstrates that, Hey, this government is sort of got off to a pretty good start. And, you know, because, they're a, a new government and you'd expect there might be some teething issues, but there didn't seem to be in this. So mm. on that score, they they really passed this test with pretty flying colours. Now, um, where that all leads is is up to them, but certainly in terms of just giving off that sense that we're in charge and we know what we're doing, they, they passed. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. Thanks, Greg. Not a problem, Ebony. <laughs> 
This episode was recorded live on Tuesday the 6th of September and things may have changed since recording. You can visit australiainstitute.org.au or futurework.org.au for all our latest research and content and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Greg Jericho is at Grog's Gamut. Our producer Jennifer Macy is at Jennifer Macy. Additional editing by Emily Perkins. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Stay safe out there and thanks for listening. 